All right. Well, I've um, just introduced myself. My name is Roger Gunn. I'm an, an author of two books, one of which is uh, this one here, Masters of the Air, uh, The Great War Pilots, McLeod, McKeever, and McLaren. And my first book is this one here, Raymond Collishaw and the Black Flight. That came out in 2013, and Masters of the Air came out in late uh, 2019. So as you can see from the cover, it's about uh, McLeod, McKeever, and McLaren. And initially, I was going to call it Two Mix and a Mac, but um, my publicist didn't really like that, didn't think it was politically correct, so we changed it to a more lofty title uh, called Masters of the Air. Uh, normally, everybody knows that authorship uh, isn't very profitable. So it, the advice to authors is always don't quit your day job. Well, I did. I, in fact, well, to be more precise, I retired from teaching uh, in the business school of the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, Nate, uh, back in September of 2018, and then devoted my time to getting this second book, Masters of the Air, published. It was a long haul. It was uh, certainly a labor of love. Uh, it had a six-year gestation period uh, to be uh, delivered, as I said, in uh, late 2019. So the takeaway for me in writing this second book was that if you have a goal, if you want to achieve something, you, if you work hard enough at it, it will come to pass. You will be able to achieve your goals. And so I was able to published uh, through Dundurn Press out of Toronto, uh, both my first and second books. So let's talk a bit about uh, Alan McLeod. Uh, at the end, there'll be a Q&A that you could uh, ask me any questions on the book or otherwise. I'd be pleased to answer them. So let's, let's before, we, before we do, let me go back to um, Masters of the Air. It's available in your favorite bookstore. It's available online through Amazon as a Kindle. And uh, so you could get it at uh, Chapters and Indigo and Amazon and, and McNally Robinson and other bookstores. So let's talk a bit about, um, let's talk a bit about Alan. Let me move uh, this so I can read all the PowerPoints. Uh, he was born on April the 20th, 1899. His father, Alexander, was a doctor in the area. And he was, he was born in, Alan was born in Stonewall. And as you know, those of you who are from Winnipeg, um, and I saw a sign about Stonewall on the, uh, flashing on the participant screens. Uh, some of you may be from Stonewall. So you'll know that it's a few minutes drive north of Winnipeg. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful little town. And that's where Alan's father uh, pra practiced medicine in the Stonewall area and also uh, in and around Winnipeg. He was also the uh, doctor for the Stony Mountain Federal Penitentiary. And uh, Alexander, Alan's dad, had, uh, had an old Ford. You guys were talking about old cars before the meeting started. And uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander McLeod had an old Ford that Alan used to drive in. Not drive, he was too young, but drive in. Alan's mother was Margaret, Margaret Lillian Arnett. So Alan's middle name is uh, his mom's maiden name, Alan Arnett McLeod. Uh, Alan had uh, two sisters, Helen and Marion. They were younger, younger sisters. And Alan, um, if you read uh, George Drew's book on World War I aviators, he, he tells a story that's quite significant. In, in Alan's childhood, uh, Alan rescued a dog that was caught in a trap. And he freed this dog from the trap and saved its life. And I think that's very prophetic to what Alan was due later on in life. And we'll see what I mean in a minute. So Alan uh, signed up to be uh, in the militia. He signed up with the Fort Garry horse in the summer of 1913, when he was 14 years old. Now, normally, 
the militia don't recruit people unless they're 18. But Alan was quite tall. He was over six feet in, in height, uh, but he had a baby face. So uh, he was very enthusiastic about joining the Fort Garry horse. And he spent the summer of 1913 uh, riding around in his uniform, which he, he quite loved because it was a nice blue tunic that he got to wear uh, when he was uh, in the uh, Fort Garry horse. Okay, technical difficulties, there we go. So there's a picture of his mom, Margaret, and there's Alan there. You can see already he's a strapping young lad. That's probably when he was only about uh, 11 or 12. And there's his sister, Helen. Marion wasn't born yet. So Alan lived in the McLeod house and that house is still standing. There's a picture I took a couple of years ago of the McLeod house, it's now a uh, it's now a tea house. They serve wonderful types of tea. And, and I had a book signing there in uh, January of, of 2020. And that was uh, where Alan grew up. And it's on Main Street right across from the old bank and uh, still standing today as a heritage site. And Alan was, uh, his room was up on the second floor. There were four bedrooms up on the second floor. So what were you doing at the age of 18? I know what I was doing. I was finishing high school, going into university. Think back what you were doing at the age of 18. Well, Alan McLeod went and got the Victoria Cross. So he, was, uh, he got the Victoria Cross when he was 19 years old for events that took place when he was still 18 years of age. Alan, when the war broke out, tried to en enlist in the army. They wouldn't accept him because he was too young. And uh, he came back later on and, and joined the Royal Flying Corps uh, in April 1917. He had just finished um, his, his birthday uh, at age, age 18. Again, born in 1899. So he was 18 and he had listened, en enlisted in the Royal Flying Corps, was accepted into the Royal Flying Corps uh, in April, there was a big party at his high school to send him off, and he and a couple of buddies took the train and went to Toronto to start their training. So here's our, our hero, um, and you can see he's quite a tall individual. Uh, he's, uh, I think this picture was taken at Varsity Stadium on the grounds of the University of Toronto, uh, because uh, he did go to the University of Toronto to start his training. And that consisted of the usual square bashing, uh, military drill, parade ground activities. Everything had to be spick and span, the boots polished, the, the brass buttons polished so you could see your face in them, that sort of thing. And from that, he, he uh, in May, a month later, he went to the School of Military Aeronautics at the University of Toronto, where they talked about and he learned about engines, uh, machine guns, what, uh, they were for, how you take them apart, put them together, and also signaling. And back in those days, they used pano or panels on the ground in different configurations uh, in order to uh, give instructions to the pilots above. So he had to do signaling with the use of these pano. Now, the pass mark was 80% on the exam. So Alan was a very studious student and he would take notes. But the problem was is that some of the instructors would talk so fast that he couldn't take notes very well. And he was very frustrated about this. He was also frustrated about the teaching of uh, engines and photography without having an engine there, without having a camera there to um, show how it was done. They just talked about engines and talked about cameras. After the initial training at the University of Toronto, uh, Alan and his uh, fellow cadets went to Long Branch. And any of you from Toronto know that Long Branch is uh, just to the west of Toronto. It's part of the Toronto metropolitan area now. Uh, but back then it was west of Toronto. And he joined the Curtis Hammond, sorry, the Glenn Hammond Curtis School of Aviation. And as you know, Glenn Curtis 
was one of the pioneers of aviation in the world. He, uh, Glenn Curtis uh, designed and built the Curtis Jenny. He started building motorcycles in uh, 1903 and 1909. And he won, uh, Glenn Curtis won the air race in Reims, France in 1909. Uh, Allen went to the Long Branch School of Aviation on June the 4th. Five days later, he soloed for the first time, June the 9th, 1917. And in the book, in Masters of the Air, I list some of the, the wonderful letters home that uh, McLeod has, has written. Let me just quickly read you one. Dear old dad, well, I'll just write you a few lines today as I haven't much time to spare. Well, I was flying for a while this morning again, Gee, it was great. I took complete control of the machine. The lieutenant said that I did really well. So there is some chance that I might become an aviator. I feel as much at home in an aeroplane now as I do in a car. Gee, it's great traveling at 200 miles an hour on a nose dive. It's some sensation when you hit the ground for a landing, you're traveling about 75 miles an hour, but you never realize it. Uh, unless you look at the speed indicator. Well, I guess I'll close now. I'm in a hurry. I asked for leave tonight so I could go and see mother. I don't know whether it will be granted or not. Well, goodbye, dear old boy, your loving son, Alan. So those are the kinds of letters he would, he would write home and many of which I've quoted in the book. Um, his mother was visiting in, uh, in Toronto when she was trying to have a, a visit. So his uh, time off wouldn't be to go to Winnipeg. It would be to uh, just go to Toronto where his, his mother was staying. From the, the Curtis School of Aviation in Long Branch, uh, Alan uh, did more training in Camp Borden. And as you know, Camp Borden is about 60 miles, 60 kilometers north of Toronto in the Lake Simcoe area. Alan thought it was an awful hole. Sand everywhere, no trees, just tents that people had to live in. And unfortunately, there were many crashes. But Alan persevered. He didn't uh, crash once. He had perfect landings. He would do cross-country flights. He learned how to do figure eights, uh, Morse code in the, uh, in the aircraft. And they used gun cameras. So they did mock dogfights, not with uh, live bullets, obviously, but with gun cameras. Alan tried to push the envelope. He broke the height record uh, for flight at Camp Borden at 12,600 feet. Already he was making a name for himself. And at the end of his training, he would have 43 hours and five minutes of solo operation uh, of an aircraft. Once his training was over, he went off to England. He sailed on the RMS Matagama. And by the way, another uh, one of the pilots I write about is Don McLaren. And uh, McLaren was in the same boat on the same trip, on the same voyage as uh, uh, Alan McLeod. It was an uneventful crossing because in that time in this First World War, they had convoys. So the, the ships were protected by convoys, protecting each other, and of course, escorted by uh, the odd destroyer or two. Alan uh, had fun and he was just a teenager, just 18 years of age. Uh, he would run around in his pajamas with his buddies, have pillow fights and such, and uh, till two and three in the morning. So that was his type of uh, activity. Other, other cadets and uh, trainees, spent time with the ladies because there were some nurses on board at the time. In any event, they crossed the Atlantic successfully and landed in uh, Liverpool and took a train down to London where he was given some leave. Early September, he got leave in London, did all the touristy things that you and I would do if we went for, to, to be in London, uh, saw some shows in the theater district, uh, went to some good restaurants, but one added attraction, not really an attraction, more of a detraction, 
uh, was that that was the time of the Zeppelin raids on London. So he experienced uh, seeing the Zeppelins dropping bombs on London. Luckily, he was not uh, injured in those. Allen's training in England was part of uh, 82 Squadron, Waddington, Lincolnshire, in mid-September to mid-October, where he flew uh, BE-2Es. And they were 5,000 pound monsters. They were, they were huge for the day anyway. And he also flew Armstrong Whitworth FK-8s. These are the big ax. They call them big ax. Uh, a wingspan of 43 and a half feet and a length of 31 and a half feet. Now, again, Alan is pushing the envelope because he was only the second person to do a loop in an FK-8, a big ax. He wasn't afraid to take risks and he wanted to show his prowess in flying. And he did that by looping the loop in a big act, only the second person to be able to do that. Part of his training was more on uh, wireless telegraphy, artillery observation. Uh, they would uh, do a, a puff of smoke as the uh, signal of, of a shell landing. And then Alan would have to figure out whether that was, uh, where that was, whether it was, uh, too far, too near to the left or the right of the target. There's our hero, Alan McLeod. You can see that he's still got his baby face. His picture was taken in London uh, when, he, when he got there um, and is a good strapping young lad. Alan went to France to join number two squadron. Number two squadron was one of the original squadrons uh, in the Royal Flying Corps, and he was he joined Number Two Squadron in November of 1917, and flew these big acts, the Armstrong Whitworth FK-8. Now um, these aren't pictures of the big act, but um, I got these from uh, one of Arthur Hammond's relatives, and she um, gave me permission to uh, show some of these photos. Uh, the plane on the left, I think, is a DH-4 or a DH-9, and the one on the right is uh, a Samson uh, 2A-2. Um, so they, they were big and cumbersome. They were heavy planes, uh, but Alan McLeod treated them uh, like they were a scout, like they were a fighter plane. These planes that he flew were built for reconnaissance activities, photography, uh, artillery observation work, and that sort of thing. At a top speed, at least the specs say that he had a top speed of uh, 98 miles an hour in the big act. More likely, uh, it would be about 90 miles an hour as a top speed in actual fact. And some of his uh, fellow pilots in squadron number two uh, didn't think he should be there. He, was, he looked so young and he had, had such a baby face that his credibility wasn't there. He had to really prove himself. And he did that. He proved himself. The more they saw his flying ability, the flawless landings, his ability to loop the loop in a big act, he started to get some credibility. His first combat came on December the 18th, 1917. Now, a big act is a two-seater. Allen's the pilot and with machine guns pointing forward, and then his observer is behind him uh, with machine guns with uh, Lewis guns firing aft. On this particular mission, December the 18th, 1917, he was with an observer called Comer, and they got into a scrap with an albatross. And between the two of them, uh, they almost shot down the albatross. Uh, the, uh, the very next day, another EA encounter, enemy aircraft, and McLeod was given credit for almost uh, shooting down uh, an enemy aircraft. It was driven down. And in those days, uh, driven down um, was one of the terms used, driven down out of control was another term used, and destroyed was a third term uh, that showed that you had a victory. So the likelihood of a driven down crashing um, was marginal, but he, he made sure that he got rid of that menace up in the air. There was another observer that he, um, he flew with, and that was Reginald Key, and uh, later on, it was Arthur Hammond. His main observer, 
Uh, and the three of them, Reg Key, Arthur Hammond, and Alan McLeod, uh, room together in the barracks. There's a picture of Arthur Hammond, courtesy of his relative. That, uh, she sent me some pictures. Quite a nice, handsome young fellow. A little older than Alan. And uh, Arthur Hammond had won the, the, the MC, the Military Cross, uh, prior to him meeting Alan McLeod. So as I mentioned, uh, Reg Key and Alan Hammond were McLeod's observers. They were roommates at the aerodrome and they lived in Nissen huts. Now a Nissen hut is something like a tin can uh, cut lengthwise. Okay, so it looks something like this. And as you can see, there it is. It looks like a tin can, doesn't it? With a corrugated metal roof, uh, semicircular shape. And there we have a picture of, of uh, Arthur Hammond on the left and uh, our friend Alan McLeod on the right, uh, both smoking pipes. So Alan wanted to look more mature, so he took up smoking a pipe, and he tried to grow a mustache, but wasn't very successful doing that. So the three of them, he, Hammond, and, and McLeod, were roommates in these Nissen huts. Let me just take a taste of water. But McLeod was mentioned in dispatches on. January the 14th, 1918. He dispatched a balloon. He shot down a balloon. And uh, Reg Key got an albatross, shot down an albatross. So again, this is a reconnaissance plane that McLeod is using. And normally it were the scouts and the, and the fighters that would uh, shoot down balloons. But oh no, again, Alan pushing the envelope or pushing the outside of the balloon and, and shooting it down. Two days later, McLeod and Hammond, after their normal ar artillery observation duties were over, attacked and had the aircraft battery. Again, something that normally would be done by a scout, by a fighter. But oh no, Alan and Hammond wanted to minimize and obliterate this anti-aircraft battery that was causing a lot of problems for any planes flying over the, the, the German lines. So because Alan was so good as a pilot, his uh, commanding officer, didn't award him any medals, but gave him some leave uh, to go back to London. So in uh, late January, 1918, Allen stayed at the Savoy. And again, we had air raids, uh, German air raids, this time by big Gotha bombers. Uh, two engine machines, 78 feet wide in, in length of wings and uh, with uh, a pilot and two gunners. And those bombers raided London and especially when Alan was there on January the 28th, uh, the Savoy Hotel was hit where he was staying and Alan was knocked off his feet. He writes home about being literally knocked off his feet with the concussion of the, of the blast of the bomb. Um, back in uh, France in March 10th, McLeod and Reg Key were in a nasty scrap with four enemy aircraft, two FALs fighters and two Albatross. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the plural of albatross? Is it albatrosses? Is it albatree? I don't know. We can have a debate about that at the Q&A period. I think it, the plural of albatross is albatross. If you have two Lexus cars, you don't have Lexuses. You have Lexus. Anyway, I think the plural of albatross is albatross. And I had done that throughout my book. Anyway, uh, Key, Reg Key, unfortunately, transferred to another squadron. He was transferred to another squadron, much to McLeod's chagrin. He was really bummed out about that because he had become very good friends with, with Reg Key. Now, at this time in the war, March 21st, 1918, that's the big German push, the big offensive, the Michael offensive. March 21, 1918, the Germans, uh, their last kick at the cat, uh, try to roll up the lines to the, to the English Channel, defeat the British and French, and win the war before the, all the American millions of soldiers could, could come over to France. So it was their last desperate roll of the dice. Uh, and the Allies lost a lot of territory during that push by the Germans. So that uh, McLeod and Hammond were doing uh, daily bombing flights against the enemy who was attacking in this big offensive. 
they would uh, fly almost, uh, they would fly every day and sometimes two and three times a day on bombing missions. And on March the 25th, McLeod attacked a German two-seater. The next day, they were again on bombing raids, two and three times a day. March the 27th, 1918, was McLeod's and Hammond's last flight. It was fog. McLeod and Hammond got separated from the rest of the planes in number two squadron and were attacked by eight Fokker D7s, Fokker triplanes. They managed to get one um, to uh, buzz off, as it were. They uh, were successful in downing one of the Fokkers, but seven others attacked uh, the big act flown by McLeod and Hammond. And one of the attackers in the Fokker triplane was a fellow by the name of Hans Kirstein. And uh, Kirstein's first victory was Alan McLeod and Arthur Hammond. So the big act was in flames. Kirstein had, uh, had wounded both Hammond and McLeod. The uh, big act was in flames. And McLeod side slipped his, his plane in order for that the flames would be going away from the, the fuselage and not towards him and Hammond. In fact, uh, McLeod gets out of the cockpit, at least one leg out of the cockpit, like getting out of a bath, to put one leg out. And uh, he was one leg out uh, to avoid the flames and one leg in the cockpit on the rudder bar and his hands on the controls. Uh, Hammond was holding on for dear life because uh, Kirstein had come underneath and fired his machine guns underneath the Big Ack, and the floor of the Big Ack was destroyed. Hammond couldn't uh, stand up. He had to hold on to the, to the gun ring that held his, his machine gun. And all the while, Hammond was trying to fend off the, the Fokker triplanes as they were machine gunning the Big Ack. McLeod tried to get his guns working and uh, fired forward on some of these enemy aircraft as well. But down and down they went in flames, pursued by all these triplanes. And McLeod was such uh, an expert pilot uh, that he was able to land his plane um, and the two of them survived the crash in no man's land, where they were shot at by the Germans in the German trenches. McLeod was thrown clear of the machine. He had to struggle to get in and out of consciousness. He had to struggle to get Hammond uh, away from that machine that still had live bombs and live ammunition aboard. Two, um, there were a number of uh, South African uh, regiments uh, in the front lines, and they came out into no man's land and dodged the bullets the Germans were firing at them and rescued the two airmen. They were patched up as best they could in the trenches and had to stay overnight before they could go to a casualty clearing station. Of course, back at the Hesdignal Air, uh, Aerodrome, those in squadron number two assumed the worst, that they had been shot down. They didn't show up. They must have been shot down. And in fact, the squadron leader sent a letter to McLeod's father saying that, unfortunately, um, McLeod has perished or, at best case scenario, is a prisoner of war. However, they were saved. Uh, McLeod and Hammond moved to the St. John's Hospital in Etaples in France, eat apples, as the Tommies would say. And on April the 1st, McLeod went to the Prince of Wales Hospital in London to recuperate, and Hammond was sent to another uh, hospital in London. So they were, they were separated for their recovery period. So that was March the 27th, they were shot down. April the 1st, they're in hospital. And on April the 20th, uh, McLeod um, has his, uh, uh, his 19th birthday. And a few days later, the Air Ministry announced that uh, McLeod would be awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest award for bravery that the British Empire could bestow on anyone. So again, what were you doing at age 18? McLeod won the VC. Hammond received a bar to his uh, MC, his military cross. Now, McLeod spent four, almost five months in hospital, April through August, recuperating from his injuries. 
He was wounded a number of times. And to make matters worse, he suffered from pneumonia. He got pneumonia while he was in hospital. Now, bear in mind, the Spanish flu is starting to travel throughout the world. The pandemic of 1918, the Spanish flu, is hitting the world in its worst way. So maybe McLeod brought the Spanish flu back uh, to Winnipeg. Hammond lost his leg. His leg had to be amputated because of all his injuries in that March 27th combat. Alan's father came to join Alan. You will, you'll recall that Alan's father was a doctor and he looked after uh, McLeod and helped him with his recovery. On September the 4th, both McLeod, uh, fils et père, father and son, uh, were in the ceremony, investiture ceremony on Buckingham, at Back, Buckingham Palace, where King George V pins the VC onto McLeod. And if you'll, if you'll look at the pictures of McLeod, babyface McLeod at the beginning of the war, and when he received his VC, you'll see a totally different person, a very gaunt face, someone who has lost a lot of weight uh, in his recovery. Anyway, they two, the two of them, the father and son, return to Canada. Um, they, they take a ship back to Canada, take a train to Winnipeg, and arrive in Winnipeg on September the 30th to a massive reception. Hundreds and thousands of well-wishers line the streets, uh, flags and bunting all over the place. The mayor gives a speech, and Alan, not being much of a speech maker, uh, doesn't say much. He just says, thank you, and that's about it. He goes to Stonewall right afterwards, and Stonewall is bedecked with flags and bunting, and they, they wish Alan well, for here comes the returning hero, uh, Victoria Cross winning Alan Arnett McLeod. In a month, he'd be dead. He died of the Spanish flu. Now, did he bring it over from England? Uh, a number of nurses were staying at the house, uh, because they were fighting uh, the, the Spanish flu throughout uh, Manitoba, throughout Canada. So they were um, rooming in the, uh, in the McLeod house. On November the 6th, 1918, five days before the end of the Great War, Alan dies at the Winnipeg General Hospital. He's buried in Kildonan Cemetery. And those of you familiar with Winnipeg know that the Kildonan Cemetery is uh, just east of downtown Winnipeg. And there's a picture uh, that was in the papers at the time of uh, six of his comrades holding the casket uh, that held uh, Alan Arnett McLeod. They, the, they buried him in Kildonan Cemetery. There's a recent picture of the gravesite where his father and uh, Alan are buried. You can see Alexander Neil McLeod, MD, 1868 to 1940, and uh, Alan A. McLeod, 1899 to 1918. Uh, the monument or the uh, tombstone, the headstone on the left uh, was put there by the uh, RCAF uh, in later years. Just as an epilogue to our story, uh, Arthur Hammond was invited by the McLeod family to emigrate to Canada, which he did in 1921. And Reginald Key, also a Brit, emigrated from England uh, in 1920 and came to Toronto. Um, Hammond worked for the Great West Life Assurance Company and then was with the RCAF during the Second World War. He retired in Victoria, B.C. and passed away in 1950. There we go. There's my presentation. <clears throat>